Hello everyone, thank you for joining our webinar session today. Just as a quick reminder, your microphones are muted by default. If you have any question, please feel free to type them in the question dialog box that we have for that purpose. Jennifer, it's all yours. Thank you very much. So good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth edition of our Signals webinar. Uh, this series was launched a couple of months ago, just when the COVID crisis became global. And as we all uh, learn to move from one phase to the other, we are keen to continue to share with you our learnings. And uh, this will include fresh data, live local perspectives, and points of view that come from the work that we are doing around the world. Today, uh, in our session, Simon will give us his update on the story so far and the evolving impact on people all around the world, with Huang Li, who is based uh, in South Korea, who will give us her personal perspective uh, from that country. Then we will have Supriya, who will be talking about innovating in challenging times, with a special focus on durables, services, and technology, and looking for hidden winners. And at last, Chris, will take us into the world of new rituals in a low touch world. So with this, I would pass on to Simon to kick off our webinar. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us um, today. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is um, firstly, just briefly stop and have a look at the information that's become available as if you like the weeks have become months. Uh, the information has got uh, bigger in terms of a resource base, so I'll quickly uh, pause on that, but really then start to look ahead to this question of what happens next and start to see what clues we can find in the latest data around how behaviours in particular may start to uh, evolve. And then, as uh, Jennifer said, we're delighted to have, have Wang Lei with us um, from, from South Korea to give us an eyewitness account of a country which, if you like, perhaps is further ahead, if, if I may call it that, uh, than, than some others. And so I hope we've got a good uh, introduction uh, for you to the session. Just to, just to kick off, um, in terms of what's available, your, your Ipsos colleagues will share with you the uh, resources and the um, information sources that will be of most interest to, to you. But we do have everything in a single place on a special COVID uh, web page. And I wanted particularly to highlight the countries uh, that we have data on. So there's a gateway to just over 20 countries, each of them with their own resources to help you understand what's happening on the ground there. And just to give you a flavor, in the US, what they've done is bring together a compilation of what they have so far of, on all the different research themes around the coronavirus. And as Jennifer mentions, we've got uh, some expert analysis coming later from Supriya and Chris. There's more of that uh, on the site. And finally, just to help us all kind of make sense of it all, we bring it together every couple of weeks in a research digest called Signals. And uh, that's just gone live, actually, within the last uh, hour or two. So those are the, some of the resources that we have. And I've tried to provide links uh, as we go through the uh, session to different data sources. Talking of which, um, what happens next? And I think the big questions we're starting to, to think about is this question of um, people looking ahead uh, and people also reflecting on their experience so far. Here are some questions around what people think of their government from the 15 country uh, survey that we've been doing since the start of the crisis. And I share with you, with it, with you partly because it's a key part of the story, but also because of the differences between countries. Two countries which in some ways might be obvious comparators, Spain and Italy, uh, in terms of their experience or in terms of their region of the world, very different views on how well uh, or not their government is doing in handling coronavirus. And similarly, the US, for example, uh, around the middle of the pack um, and others, uh, Australia, Canada, India, uh, with rather more positive ratings. So big differences by country. And the other thing to mention here are the changes over time. Uh, we asked these questions on the government uh, a month ago, uh, and it's fair to say this is not a, uh, a linear um, experience because some countries are moving in one direction, Australia, Canada, Germany, Mexico, people becoming more positive about what their governments are doing. Others, France, Japan, 
Russia, Brazil, views are becoming less positive. And I think that dynamic uh, is something we have to be uh, very much aware of rather than assuming everything will follow a kind of rational um, order. Talking about the dynamics, um, one of the countries we've been tracking through the process is Spain. And there our colleagues have been asking a question where people have been self-assessing how they feel today. And 45 days in to the quarantine, uh, I think it's fair to say that people in Spain are starting to look ahead. Uh, you'll see many people now at the kind of lower end of that chart looking uh, forward, but with a mixture of relief and fear. Chris will talk about some of the emotions in a moment. Uh, but what I would say is that um, it's a reminder that people are not all at the same, pa same page. Some people still in an adjustment or an acclimatization uh, position. And uh, this also uh, is evident when we look at France. Yes, 63% say they're ready to return to a normal life. But I didn't uh, put that as a green, uh, I put it as an amber because only a quarter of people say they're perfectly ready. And indeed, um, many people say they're not ready. And it rises among people who have an ongoing health condition, or indeed many people like us on this call who are perhaps working from home and for whom going back to work uh, may involve a certain number of concerns, not least about uh, public transport. So fair to say that people are looking ahead, but it's not necessarily um, looking ahead to sunshine and, and a problem-free coming period. As we look ahead, one of the questions, of course, is our behavior is going to change. And I'm sharing with you some data now from the United States where we've been asking people week on week um, what they've been doing uh, recently. And I've picked out three themes which felt quite instructive just in terms of markers for us to really watch uh, around how behaviours may be uh, changing. The first one is about going out to eat. Uh, just 9% have, have done that in the last week. And it's quite striking really uh, just how quickly that's changed because as recently as the 13th to the 16th of March, that figure was 56%. But 69% say they've had a takeout meal. And it underlines perhaps uh, the fact that people still want their leisure time. They may have less money and they may be very worried about the future, but they will uh, take a moment uh, to go out and if you like, spend that time uh, uh, in this case uh, in takeout meals. Second one is about self-quarantining. The headline on one level is that this is down from 53% on the 10th to the 13th of April. America starts to ease uh, out of lockdown. Well, that's when you talk about staying at home for 14 days. But if you talk more generally about avoiding contact with others as much as possible, that's staying about the same week on week. And it's almost like that's a mindset that people's uh, heads are in, at least for the moment, that we avoid other people. And that's something we really need to keep watching. And in that vein comes this question about how quickly things will change. At the moment, 69% uh, say it's risky uh, to meet friends and, and, and family, but it was 79% two weeks ago. And this question of perhaps how quickly we will feel comfortable or at least less uncomfortable about doing some of those things we uh, were doing every day or every week in our previous lives is of course gonna be something to watch. And just to finish on our tour of, if you like, different markets and different contexts, I wanted to share with you these numbers around uh, the tracing app um, from New Zealand and from Australia, partly because this will be part of the dialogue that we're going to see in many markets in the coming period. It raises such questions around future of technology and privacy and uh, access to that technology, but also coming back to that point about context. Uh, because New Zealand and Australia may be two countries that one might sometimes bundle together in our analysis. And it, it just underlines that perhaps uh, we need to be careful about doing that, at, certainly in this fluid uh, times. And the individual markets are often uh, what we need to look at and take learnings and take as case studies. So what I've done is also give you a pointer to another study we've done in seven markets that gives the opportunity to drill down into some of those let's say, case study markets. So it has Sweden and Austria, for example, who've also got their own particular journeys that we can take learnings from and, and perhaps use as reference points. 
And on that subject of reference points, uh, we're so pleased to have Huang Lei with us. She stayed up. Um, she stayed up late because it's past midnight in. in Seoul. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Huang Lei, for for joining us. I think the I think the big the big you know issue that we're seeing, I suppose, those of us outside Korea, is that <laughs> you're a country which had so many cases uh, a couple of months ago, and in recent times, um, the number of cases has slowed to um, to just a small number. So uh, such an interesting journey the country's been on, and we're fascinated in your take on you know what's happening on the ground tell us more about let's say uh you know the current mood in 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 korea uh, as you see it yeah sure um hi everyone my name is wang lei i'm um um chief client director for samsung account and i'm based in seoul korea and it's really glad to share some positive news on covid 19 situation in korea because um recently we got very low cases and today we got only four cases, um, but three of them are coming from overseas, not local infections, which is very good um, mood. Um, actually, we didn't do very strict um, lockdown, but still we uh, were advised to stay at home during you know, a couple of weeks. Um, but the last Sunday, the central government uh, declared the end of the strict social distancing and now we moved to everyday life distancing, which is more relaxed one. Um, officially, we uh, reopened most uh, public places such as museum, um, galleries, or you know, sports stadium, etc. And um, it's a really good thing is the professional football league and baseball league started from yesterday. Um, even though uh, the crowd is not allowed it in the stadium, but still we could enjoy and um, be very, very excited to see watching, you know, by TV broadcasting. So people are really, really, you know, happy about that. And last week we had six day um, the holidays, including Buddha's birthday, Labor Day, Children's Day, um, today um, Parents' Day, etc. So the people um, did a lot of local traveling and um, did a lot of you know, shopping. We call it uh, revenge shopping because people were really, really um, crazy for buying something for themselves because they think it's kind of a deserved you know, gift for mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. So which is um, the found very you know, interesting things. Still very cautious with masks and having distance mm -hmm. and hygienic attitude that I would say. Uh, but we have more relaxed and easy life here in Korea. <laughs> but yeah, but, I mean, it's so good to to hear if you like um, at least some sunlight coming coming through. And and because uh, one of the you know big things we, mm -hmm. people talk about is the Korean curve and the journey the the country has been through from those very high incidents mm -hmm. of early cases. Mm -hmm. uh, as a researcher, what have you been seeing, kind of? Uh, in terms of uh, how people's behavior have been, has been changing during this very fluid period? Right. Actually, the COVID-19 situation has brought tremendous changes in Korean society. I cannot, you know, even mention everything right now. But if I uh, were to pick a couple of things, the first one is about working from home. Because, you know, Korea labor industry um, really desire to have those kind of things. But you know, the Asian culture, we kind of you know community life. We eat together, we work together, we do something together. That's really important value before. But you know, now working from home is more generalized way of you know working here. Um, so that creates a lot of other uh, following trends. Um, for example, like you know, we uh, had more family time. So normally weekday, we can't have dinner with my you know partner or kids but you know last two months we every day we had dinner together mm -hmm. and also we had more you know time staying at home so we have a lot of hobbies at home and doing a lot of fun things at home with family and also you know digital transformation is also big changes so regardless of age we need to learn you know the use more frequently and more smarter way of digital things because we do a lot of online you know class online work virtual work so you know my parents you know um last month they bought the, their first smartphone because they want to buy something online and they order something you know um, with smartphone 
So I think that kind of trend will be continued even after the COVID situation. And what else? Um, the social um, socializing is really important value before, but now we need to get more individualized one to protect mm -hmm. ourselves. That's a yeah. big change in Korea, I think. Yeah. And what how, but and, how, and how about you? I mean, as you know, you've been uh, um, <laughs> you've been yeah. living, living through it. You've got your parents, uh, you know, buy, buying smartphones for the first time. You're having to adapt to all of the you know changes that you have. Mm -hmm. that you, what's the what's the recent weeks been like for you in your own life? Right. Um, the recent time is very unique experience to me as a, you know, the, the global clients, you know, lead. I'm quite used to, you know, get together um, or the having meeting together, you know, virtually. But even to me, it's far more, you know, um, challenging time because I need to train myself for better productivity. Um, how to concentrate on on my work at home because you know my kids are always bothering me <laughs> and how to um, relieve my stress control my stress how to communicate well better uh, with my clients as well so that's a new thing personally and what else having more time with family is you know again it's really you know good to me because I have 14 year old boy um, son at home. Normally in Korea, those you know kind of communication with you know 14 year old boys almost impossible. <laughs> but I think I'm more confident to you know having chat with him now because I knew him better and I understand him better, and it's good time. And also I found my talent or cook. So I shop many, many grocery items for cooking myself. So yeah, that's a kind of good changes to me. <laughs> that's an, well, that's a, thank you. I mean, it's so interesting just to hear both both the story and, and as you say, I think um, I can sympathize with you because I was a 14 year old boy once. So I think that's been a, a really good, good, good time and different time for you. I'm going to hand back to Jennifer Bye. in Milan now, who is, um, I think, going to be allowed out for the first time almost uh, this weekend, aren't you, Jennifer? Yes, yes, yes. So with the, the, the shutdown, the lockdown has been uh, gradually, is gradually reopening since Monday, but I haven't been out of home yet, but it's, it'll come, it'll come. So uh, yeah, Huangli, it was great to hear your, your experience. I, I have a last question. So you've told us about what you've been through and uh, mm -hmm. shared personal views. What are you expecting next in the coming weeks and months for your life in, in Seoul? You know, every day, you know, the news program and media have a lot of, you know, expectation, you know, um, expectation the agendas. So that many people say that a kind of unpacked service will be more and more popular in Korea because now we can order, you know, even small coffee using the kiosk in the cafe. So we, we don't have to meet any, you know, person to get the um, order. And also the home delivery items, you know, the delivery man just, you know, um, drop the items in front of the door without seeing anyone. And also the doctor, you know, the, the prescription we can get through online. So those kind of untapped service and also um, it should be well facilitated by, you know, fast broadcasting system or the network system. So those kind of related industry will be booming. So that's a kind of you know short term you know mm. findings from my so side. So a lot of uh, let's say new types of services and a great use of technology, which yes, sets yes. very nicely for our next speaker. So thank you very much, Wangli. That was uh, that was okay. uh, spot on. Our next You're speaker, Supriya, who will be talking about innovating in challenging times and specifically about. Uh, services, durables, and technology, which is very much in line with what we just heard. Supriya, thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. In a previous session of the webinar, we spoke about innovating in challenging times and focused specifically on fast-moving consumer goods. Today, we'll be talking about durables, services, and technology. Within the past few weeks, we've seen a very rapid change in consumer behavior. As we were hearing from Huang Lei, the people are really trying hard to cope with the current situation, 
to remain productive, to remain creative, to remain connected with everyone. And some of the trends or signals you see in social media are things like Dalgona coffee. I hope you've heard about that one. Um, the people are baking bread from scratch. They're using Zoom calls to connect with people, remote learning, remote working. And then there are the TikTok fitness challenges and dance challenges. So this is all, people are really trying hard to rise above the confinement of their space at this time. And in order to do that, they're making investments in durables and services, things like bread machines, sewing machines, printers, laptops, monitors for productivity, delivery services, and of course, subscriptions for entertainment and learning and other things. So this is actually the first time that we are seeing this really strong pull from the consumers. They are actively seeking service-based and technology-based solutions. This is a very, very unique situation because in the past we've, had, we've seen it takes a long time for consumers to adopt these solutions. A great example is mobile banking. It took such a long time to convince people to start using their, their apps to deposit checks. They would still prefer to go to banks. But now the environment is forcing us to accelerate the adoption of these solutions. Of course, the first question that comes to our minds is, are we being insensitive if we reach out to consumers during this time? For that, let's look at China for some inspiration. We heard from Huang Lei about Korea. In China, we saw the ramp up of driverless delivery technologies, increased usage in online medical services, but the most surprising one for me was the explosion in high-tech beauty products. Local beauty companies were able to switch their business models within days to go from brick and mortar retail to being on social media and connecting with their consumers one-on-one. -on -one. They were present and digital. They did not pull back their market presence. They were relevant and adaptable, aiming to be top of mind, and they were positive. They showed up with an eye towards the future and empathy for consumers. In order to understand consumer adoption in these spaces a little bit more, services, tech, and durables, we did a deep dive into the Ipsos Vantis concept testing database. This is the world's largest concept testing database outside of consumer goods, and it has 39,000 concepts across 66 countries. Now, the current crisis clearly isn't comparable to any previous ones, but the only common thread between the current crisis and previous ones is the financial hardship. So we looked at the recession years of 2008-2009, post-crisis years of 2010-2012, as well as recent years, 2016-2019, to look at how response to innovation during these three time periods compares to the database average. Here's what we found. Across all three time periods, the response, consumer response to liking, value, and uniqueness remains almost completely aligned with the database average. What that means is environmental factors don't necessarily impact people's perceptions of what they like, what they value, or what they find unique. What's more interesting is when you look at purchase intent, intent to sign up or intent to use, the primary intent question. We have clearly seen certain categories are seeing heightened demand and others are being challenged. But when we look at the data, in 2008-2009, the previous crisis, there was a slight decline in interest. And this persisted in the post-crisis years. So while the change in behavior happens very rapidly, it takes time to come back to stability. There's a ramp of three to four years from the start of a crisis until when the results remain stable. Think about the travel industry. Would you be willing to take a flight right away as the, as the crisis lifts? Probably not. So really, we need to think about using this runway for innovation for development for the future. And future-focused development involves looking beyond the obvious. Most companies want to see green flags on all of the KPIs so that they feel confident about moving forward with the right idea. However, given the current circumstances, we suggest looking at the profile of the innovation and not specifically the KPIs. 
we have a system called archetypes which reveals the the personality profile of the innovation things like breakthrough premium niche and this is based on our history of testing and there are 24 different archetypes this is how it comes to life so when you have all green flags you have a winner archetype but given the current environment, there is a likelihood if you're in a change category that your purchase intent will be depressed. So you'll have a promising archetype. These are still really good ideas that should be kept in the innovation pipeline because as things gradually return to stability, these could be very successful. Another interesting archetype is breakthrough. Breakthrough ideas have low purchase intent and low value perceptions but people like them and find them unique. It takes a lot of time and commitment and investment to actually turn a breakthrough idea into a successful product. Here are a couple of examples. First, Fitbit is a wearable activity monitor. When we first tested the Fitbit, it, the archetype was niche and it resonated really well among young moms. The second one is iPad, when we first tested the iPad, it tested with a breakthrough archetype. Both of these products have, of course, gone on to be extreme successes. And to get there, the companies have had to work on providing clear communication, strong support, and a commitment over a longer period of time to support the product. To wrap it up, Leverage digital channels, consider service models, demonstrate initiative, and respond to consumer needs in this current environment. There is a runway for innovation. As results remain valid for three to four years, make use of this runway to plan your future innovations and future-proof your business decisions by looking for hidden winners, by looking at the profile of the innovation and not just the KPIs. Finally, Think about what you are doing to cope with this environment, what changes you have made in your lifestyle. I spoke to some of my colleagues and most of them are investing in technology and services to cope with this change. Think about how your products will play in this evolving world. Over to you, Jennifer. Lots of very good examples there. Thank you for, for sharing those, uh, those quotes with uh, things that people have cha changed in their lives. So you, um, Supriya, are very much immersed in technology for your work. So I was wondering in your personal life, how has technology, how have you leveraged technology to cope during this period? Uh, Jennifer, you know, the usual things like buying printers and things to remain productive, but the most interesting example for me is there was one week when my kids were not remote schooling and we had to find a way to keep them busy. And we were able to set up Zoom meetings with extended family that lives all across the world that kept them engaged, teaching them dancing, singing, all kinds of art. Um, and the kids learned more about their culture during that one week than they have in, in a long time with me. So to me, that one week was literally the highlight of this lockdown and, and a good use of technology. Great. Technology as a cultural enabler, that sounds uh, very intriguing and very good. Thank you so much, Supriya. And now uh, I will hand over to Chris for the last uh, section of our webinar today on uh, behavior change and um, rituals in this low touch world. To you, very Chris. good. Um, and Jennifer, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Very good. Okay, so um, this is my uh, second opportunity to, to speak on uh, one of these Signals webinars. Um, and uh, for, for those of you uh, who heard our, our first piece on brand, um, I shared this particular graphic, which helps us understand the drivers of brand selection. And as illustrated here, and I believe uh, as was reinforced in Signals Part 3 uh, by Benoit Transair, um, we are adaptive decision makers, um, and our behavior is influenced by a range of external and internal factors. Uh, and with the spread of the virus, it has essentially liquefied the stability of both our physical and social environments. So with our context so fundamentally shaken, 
uh, we are basically operating in a fluid time of distress where we can't really uh, depend on some of those automatic behaviors or mindless decisions that, that we used to make when we could choreograph our, our, our days uh, uh, pretty intentionally. Um, so uh, because our automatic behaviors have become a bit more deliberative, um, we are more in active listening mode. Um, and that's uh, particularly um, advantageous for brands because we are paying more attention to what brands say and what brands do in, in these times. So it is a critical and unique time for brands to both be present um, and as Benoit communicated last week to, to really lean in and, and get close. Um, so uh, just to be you know, really clear, I think there, there were some comments earlier in the discussion about uh, the appropriateness you know, of, of brands Almost everyone globally is quite concerned about the economy, their own personal financial situation. Um, and there is an expectation that brands uh, will not only help them you know, navigate the crisis, but also continue to communicate with them about what they have to offer. Uh, people want to see evidence that you know, economic wheels are indeed in motion. Um, and even though the, the literature is quite thick with studies that will tell us that going dark in a recessionary period has proven to be a pretty poor choice, um, we still see a lot of advertisers either pausing or pulling campaigns. Um, so again, while it's very important that we're not perceived as crisis profiteers, um, most consumers do understand um, that, that marketing serves an economic purpose and, and, and they expect to see it and, and they certainly don't look uh, negatively upon brands for, for, for doing so. The other thing to consider here um, and I mentioned this in, in, the, in the last uh, webinar, we are living in an era where people are increasingly open to brands as opposed to traditional institutions to promote social progress, to promote well-being. Um, and, and, and this current crisis could well accelerate that trend, that pattern, if indeed brands do rise to the occasion. So let's have a quick look at kind of what that's meant um, you know, over the past few months. So I think back in, in March, uh, you know, in early March especially, most brands were dead silent. Um, and then you started to see uh, some brands start to step forward as a source of truth and positive impact and to start to express uh, some, you know, uh, really strong shows of empathy. Um, and, and at that time, that was, it was very welcome. Um, I, I think you know, any trusted source of accurate information was quite welcome at that time. Um, and I, I think we've all probably seen this installation you know, um, of, of the Coca-Cola sign in Times Square where it says, you know, staying apart is the best way to stay united along with the elongated brand treatment. Um, and you know, in, in its moment, just a, a, an excellent, well-timed, appropriately toned message. Since that time, uh, I think it's fair to say a number of brands have jumped on that bandwagon, so much so that it's become almost impossible to differentiate you know, uh, one spot from another that, that's trying to, to reach out and say, oh, you know, we're, we're empathetic, we're here for you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're moving to a point where I think it, it's much more uh, impactful for brands to start to recognize and affirm new social norms and even help people start to build rituals at home and make it clear to them what their role is as, as they do so. But we'll come back to that theme in just a moment. But first, let's take a quick step back and, and see how people are feeling kind of relative to this notion of settling into a routine. Um, this is just a, a, an extract from our, our global tracker uh, that Simon mentioned earlier. And, and in this particular question, we're just asking people to self-identify into one of six kind of coping stages. And the big takeaway from this slide is, you know, most of us have moved either to or past a phase where we are developing a new set of routines. But routine does not always equate to comfort. Right. So as you take a deeper look into uh, the people who are establishing new routines or have established new routines, you still see this international anxiousness around physical and, and financial health. So um, as consumers figure out their new set of routines, they are doing so in a general state of discomfort. So it's, it's natural for brand leaders to say, OK, um, you know, I want to understand which of these new behaviors, which of these new routines are going to be durable, 
over time. You're starting to hear that expression more and more. We're also getting flooded with material speculating about the nature and the timing of the new normal, right? Um, so as, as we start to address that, let's take a brief academic detour, and I promise it'll be brief, uh, but want to talk about how routines become rituals and what that can kind of mean for, for brand strategy. So quick definition of terms, a routine, when I use that term, it's just a general pattern of behavior that's performed with little thought, right? Um, but a more strictly observed routine can become a ritual if it starts to be imbued with meaning. And rituals often emerge in times of great uncertainty or great duress to allow us to feel a sense of normalcy. So you, I'm sure you're looking at that red text there and seeing terror management theory. Um, and it's probably a good thing we didn't name this webinar terror management theory or God knows nobody would have turned up. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on it, but what it's basically saying is uh, when people are afraid um, or, or particularly when the specter of death is very real and, and quite salient, they start to crave cultural membership to build self-esteem. They start to crave uh, ritualistic behavior because uh, it gives them a sense of control. It gives them a sense of normalcy. Uh, much has been written on this topic. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind about rituals is they do fulfill a need. Um, and then with each passing repetition, they get reinforced as they get easier and easier to perform. So when we think about durability or the question of durability, we want to think about need fulfillment, um, meaning, ease of performance, and repetition. So in this kind of a new low touch context in which we find ourselves, there is an opportunity for brands to start to connect um, with these new behaviors and, and to start to link their brands uh, a little more inextricably with some of those new behaviors. So you know, how do you become part of a ritual experience? We're, we're suggesting a four-step program here. One, you know, let's figure out um, of the new routines that are starting to be established, which ones can achieve ritual status? Uh, and then how do we infuse those things with meaning? Second, you know, how do we drive internalization of enjoyable new habits that are meeting needs and they're easy to perform? And, and how do we start to, to affix benefit associations with those? The third bit is, is very important um, because brands can help illustrate a sense of shared experience. When we try something new or we, we, we do something new within the confines of our own household, we're kind of wondering, are we the only ones doing this? Is anybody else doing this? Uh, because if they are, and if we can start to demonstrate that others are doing this too, it, it gets, um, it, we, we create kind of the, the appearance of, of social normacy um, and others are, are much more likely to repeat it. Um, and then lastly, and this is true from almost any brand presentation, it is always important that the uh, what we say aligns with the what we do, right? In, in terms of, of, of a brand experience that is reinforcement for brand communications. So given the nature of rituals and the potential emergence of so many new ones, it is an opportune moment for brands to identify potentially ritualized behavior, uh, build benefit associations with them, affirm those behaviors, start to illustrate the sense of social consensus around them, and then to align your brand clearly with those meaningful behaviors. Now, this is an example uh, for, from Europe. I, for those of you who are familiar with the, the, the brand BrewDog, um, they have uh, begun setting up virtual pubs where people can enjoy online ordered drinks together with their friends. And they're picking up just on a very fundamental need people have to share drinks with their friends. It's something they really miss, right? Um, and they have further imbued that experience with meaningful activities like music and comedy acts. Um, you can also order drinks via their Hop Drop app. Um, and so what they've really done here is create the essence of an English pub in an online environment. Um, and, and what they're doing here is communicating the normalcy of a shared experience while showcasing their brand's role in facilitating that experience. So it, it's quite clever. Um, there, there are a number of other examples we, we could give as well, uh, but uh, we're, we're a bit short on time. So I'm going to uh, con conclude with the, the key takeaways here. You know, one, you know, brands do play an important role in the economic recovery. People get that. They're eager to hear from us as a result. Um, they are also much more attuned right now to what we are saying. So it is a unique opportunity to really connect deeply given the disruption that we're all going through, given that we've been thrown out of automatic rhythms and, and we are more attentive. 
Third, um, if we have a good understanding of rituals and how they develop, then we can start to figure out which routines might be developed to be durable, repeatable, and, and most importantly, associated with brand meaning. And then last, um, again, given that we're in the state of disruption, this is an opportune time for brands to become central figures in the development of those new consumer rituals. Thanks so much, and back to you, Jenna. Thank you very much, Chris, for that uh, great food for thought that you've shared there. And uh, I, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, you talked a bit about advertising. And indeed, it's true that these days there's uh, lots of advertising looks a bit similar. And there's, there's even been some sort of fun videos about this. And yeah. I was is it, is it you know, a, a complete waste of money for a brand to just be another brand that is saying we're all we're in this all together? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a great question. I think uh, at this point, the truth is there's not much to gain uh, from getting swallowed up in that same sea of sameness, right? Um, and, and I think a lot of us have seen those parody ads that you're talking about where they poke fun at the number of COVID ads that follow that similar pace, that similar composition and scoring uh, and, and the, the use of repetitive terms like extraordinary times and we're here for you and we're all in this together. I mean, how many times have we heard that? Um, and, and we know as, as advertiser, uh, advertisers and testers of advertising that if we don't get good brand linkage, we've essentially wasted our money, right? Um, so if everybody's saying the same dang thing, um, then, then but by definition, it's just not a great use of money right now. Much better for brands to speak in an appropriate tone, um, and but drive home their own positioning. So yeah, good, great question. Great, another, another good piece of advice there. So thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much to all the speakers and to all of you who have been uh, with us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Signals webinar in a couple of weeks time. Bye-bye everyone, bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.